So I'm going to talk about wine. And wine is part of humanity. It's been with us for a very long time. I'm going to talk about senses and sense data and how sense data is part of what makes us distinctly and uniquely human. So my journey with wine started grad school. I didn't really think about it too much growing up. Would rather go horseback riding with my dad and get out on the ranch than get into wine and talk about it, drink Keystone Light or Coors Light. But at grad school, I started thinking about wine. What is wine? Why is it so pervasive through our culture? Why is it so pervasive through humanity? Why does it show up in religion so much? Why is it just part of us like that? And so my journey started when my dad, who's in the audience, he hired me out of grad school at UC Davis. And my job was to make wine as good as any from our regions, from our vineyards. So my family has vineyards in Livermore Valley, beautiful Appalachian. We are in the Livermore Valley Appalachian right now. And we have vineyards in Arroyo Seco in Monterey County. So I would drive down to Arroyo Seco once a week, lots of windshield time, alone. Get up at 4.30, driving by 4.45, you miss the traffic through Silicon Valley, and then you're down there, go through Soledad, sun comes up, Santa Lucia Highlands are on your right, and it's just lots of time to think about wine. What is wine? Wine is fundamentally fermented sugar. Now, does it have to be grapes? No. You can have barley wine, you can have a honey wine, mead, you can have rice wine, all these different things. So it's just fermenting. And arguably, wine and fermenting sugar has been around for as long as you know, man's been upright. And now the, the history of wine goes back deep. As early as we have writing, we have symbols of wine. So just, again, part of culture. But then as I'm driving down, thinking about wine and to make high quality wine, What's quality? And that question made me a little bit crazy for a period of life because does quality reside in the human that takes that sip of wine? Or does quality reside in the wine itself? Does it matter? No, that'll be the point of the talk because it doesn't fundamentally matter as long as you're you know, having pleasure and that person is enjoying that moment with that glass of wine. But fundamentally, when I talk about wine today, it's gonna be about wine that comes from Vitis vinifera. So Vitis vinifera is the genus and species of the noble grapevines of which Chardonnay, Cabernet, Petit Verdot, Petit Syrah, Malbec, Tempranillo, Triga Nacional, Triga Francesca, Suzanne, Marsan, Roussan, Viognier, Syrah, Senso, Grenache, Graciano, Orange Muscat, Muscat Canelli, Nebbiolo, Sangiovese, Barbera, Zinfandel, Pinot Grigio, Pinot Blanc, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir. Those are all Vitis vinifera, and Vitis vinifera is phenomenally awesome. Why? because it accumulates sugar to about 24%. That's way higher than any other fruit. You try and make strawberry wine, there's not enough sugar there, so when you ferment it, the alcohol is not at a point where it's stable. So, Vitis vinifera accumulates more sugar than any other fruit. Vitis vinifera has a pH that gives it in that 3.3 to 3.6 range. Blah, blah, blah. What does that mean? It means it's stable. It has nice acidity and so it has stability to it. Also, the primary acid in Vitis vinifera is tartaric acid, which is not bioavailable. Most other acids are consumed by bacteria. So these things make wine inherently stable. When I say wine for the rest of this talk, I'm talking Vitis vinifera wine. So it's inherently stable. No human pathogens can survive in wine. So it's inherently good for you. Right? And, it's just, and then Vitis vinifera, in all of these different types, whether it's the Chardonnay or the Cabernet, it has more molecules than any other fruit that are sensorily recepted by us. So this incredible diversity and array that will come through in that fruit. So as I'm driving down windshield time, driving to a Royal Seco, thinking about wine, thinking about quality, what is quality, Dad's directive, my family's directive was make high quality wine. Make wine as high of quality as anybody in the regions. And I like how he said it like that. Don't make the best because that's a unicorn. Just make high quality wine. Yes, sir. So as I go down and thinking about it, I think about how wine derives its flavors. First is from the vineyards, the fruit. We've talked about that. Now the flavors that you can get out of grapes you can have characteristics of mango, papaya, guava, pineapple, apple, pear, citrus, plum, cherry, 
All of these are descriptors that people have used about wine when you sense that. Next, as wine gets its flavor, from the yeast. That fruit needs to be fermented. So again, that 24% sugar in that wine gets fermented and the yeast gobble up all this sugar and they convert it into alcohol, ethanol, and CO2. CO2 goes away unless you capture it like beer or like sparkling wine. You can put a top on it and keep it in there to drive that carbonation so you don't actually have to whoo, shoot it across the room and try and catch it over there, which is something I'd actually like to do. Um, and then, so the yeast. So at the peak of the fermentation, there's three quarters of a billion yeast cells for every milliliter of fluid. Three quarters of a billion unique organisms that are gobbling up sugar, converting it to alcohol. And then at the end of the fermentation, it's now at about 13% alcohol, and those yeast just made enough alcohol they can no longer survive. So that's sort of why Vitis vinifera is perfect, right? Right at the edge of where they can survive, now they settle down to the bottom. So as we talk about flavors, all the diversity of flavors that come from the grapes, that come from the vineyards, that come from your row direction, that come from this makeup of your soil, the organic matter, the zinc, the molybdenum, the potassium, the boron, all the different things, the organic matter in your soil, the clone, how that grapevine's growing, all those different flavors in the fruit. Then you have the yeast that are ultimately gonna impact some flavor. Think about the diversity of flavors of bread just from the yeast itself. Now that little microcosm of thought, you can think about the diversity of flavors that can come in based on the fermentation. And with Chardonnay, at the end of the fermentation, that yeast will settle down to the bottom, and then you'll have that yeast cell start to open up and you'll get some of this creamy, yeasty, nutty, dough-like characteristics coming through. So all this diversity from the fruit, all this diversity from the yeast, and then barrels can come into play as well. So with a barrel, you cut down a tree, you quarter it, you make staves, you crosshatch it, let it season for either 30, 24 months, 36 months, bring it into a cooper, bend it over an oak fire, sand it down first, clean it up, it's just been sitting out there just seasoning in the rain for a while, bend it over an oak fire and then toast it. Basically bake the inside of that wood. So what's wood made up of? As a gross generalization, we'll say lignin, which is what's the strong, why we can build with it, a big organic polymer, cellulose, cell wall material, sugar, and water. What happens when you toast lignin? You get molecules that are very close to or exactly cumin, clove, coriander, nutmeg, vanilla, almond, fake vanilla, fake almond, all those different ground spices and that can come through there. So that's just by toasting that. Then you toast cellulose and you get toast characteristics. You think about a crustini at 200 degrees in the oven or a crustini at 500 degrees and that difference of those toast levels. So when the wine goes into that barrel, the wine that has all of these flavors from the grape itself, more than any other fruit out there, and it's inherently stable and it's inherently good for you, then that goes into the barrel and those get in there. And then last, there's sugar, right? This, this uh, tree, this oak tree, is taking water and nutrients from the roots on up, and in the miraculous photosynthesis, it is making sugar in those leaves and sending it down. So all of those little, those little dots you see in the cross out of a wood are pipes, and that pipe has water and sugar. What happens when you caramelize sugar? I mean, excuse me, what happens when you toast sugar? I gave you the answer. It caramelizes, right? And that caramelization, you think about the diversity of flavors you get from a caramelization at the temperature and how it goes. So then when you toast water, bye-bye. So that's not part of the overall. So now you have this fruit with more diversity of flavors. You have yeast and all of their different living metabolism that happens as it's fermenting the wine. Then you have all this diversity of flavor from the barrel. Also, the origin of where that tree was grown, was that tree grown on the north-facing slope, a south-facing slope? Was that tree grown in the south of France, the north of France? Was it in Pennsylvania? Was it in Arkansas? Was it in Missouri? All of these things are gonna change the makeup of that barrel. Thus, those molecules are getting in to the wine itself as it ages there. Lastly, malolactic fermentation is when malic acid converted into lactic acid and you get that buttery characteristic. You all had a Chardonnay where you said, wow, there's a little butter in there? It's because of the malolactic fermentation. So the point of all of that is wine has more diverse individual unique molecules than anything else we consume. So with that, now this is all me just driving down to Royal Seiko 
regularly thinking about wine and what is quality. And at the same time, I started, I read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Piercek, which is about the metaphysics of quality. So now, I like to think, and Robert Piercek talked about going to the high country of the mind to think, to meditate, to conceptualize, to ponder all of those different things. And then so I'd listen to it as a book on tape, and I'd think about it, and I, and I wanted to understand it, and the first time I did. And then I'd go and I'd read some of the references that he had, and I'd get into antiquity a little bit, and uh, Homer and Virgil, and some of the lessons that come out of antiquity. Really what bubbles up, wisdom, courage, and moderation, among other things, but wisdom, courage, moderation, and then I'd read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, trying to understand a little bit more. And then I'd go into the Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and could quality be what Plato calls the good? Maybe, don't know if I totally understand that, and then I'd get into dialectic and rhetoric and how it all goes, and is it about communication, is it in the wine, is it, is it in the head of the person, where does it lie? And then, uh, you know, and ultimately Robert Pierce had a pretty big bee in his bonnet about Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. So I thought, okay, he's not trying to point in that direction. And ultimately, Piercig had these chachakwas, is what he called them. And they were effectively TED Talks, right? So I love the circle that comes back. And he would try and just educate in what was in his head. And he first started questioning, right? There's dualities that persist, right? There is classic versus romantic, hip versus square, logical versus emotional. And very importantly to this and my concept of wine is subjective objective. The subjective is you, is all of you, and the object is the wine. Is quality of that glass of wine in the wine itself or in the eye of the beholder? Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. It's an easy way to go down that path and take that one. But no, there's more molecules in that wine than any other, and it's so good and so yummy and so healthful, it must be in the wine. Which is it, which is it? So you keep on fast forwarding, and then I would take a break from Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and read some more. Uh, the Bahá'í Gita, the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, and then I'd come back and I'd go through Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance again. And ultimately, the point that he came with is that we are of sense data. How great, because I'm in wine and people that are taking a sip of wine, it's all about the sense data. So the classic five senses, sight, Light waves coming in and hit, hits our eye, create sense data, sense data creates a thought. Sound, the waves of the air coming in, hit the eardrum, they touch the eardrum, it creates sense data, signal to the brain. Taste, something in your mouth, creates sense data, goes into your brain, creates a thought. We already did ear, we did mouth, now smell. One of the best ones of them all, especially as it relates to wine. These molecules go into your nose, and basically the vibration of that molecule will then create sense data, and then a signal goes to your brain. Lastly, touch. Touch, interaction, sense data, signal to the brain. Five senses, that's what we've been taught. Uh, lo and behold, the new theories out there, there is also pain sensors, pressure, uh, thirst, hunger, time, temperature, itch. I think itch is like touch, but they say it's not. Itch and muscle tension. There's sensors for that. There's also magnetic sensors, right? Some people have great sense of direction. Do we really all have magnetic sensors in us? Absolutely. Now lobster, they migrate just purely on the magnetics of the earth. So it's there. There's also a quick, uh, uh, equilibrium sensors that are a big part of it. There's also chemical sensors. There's also sensors that tell us where we are in space so you know where your hands are in relation to your body. So all of these senses, they're receptors, they create sense data, and they send a signal to the head, to the brain that becomes a thought. So now, let's get back to wine, right? Because that's the fun part of it. And wine really allows the exploration of the primary five like no other. Right? You look at the color, if it's a white wine, a beautiful gold, or if it's a red wine, that beautiful red. 
And then you take, you smell, and you go retronasally, and you get all these things, cherry, plum, uh, apple, pear, citrus, uh, toasty oak, vanilla, yeasty, creamy, nutty, dough, like all of these senses that are coming through. And then take a sip of it, and you get the taste, plus the retronasal coming back. And then why do we cheers? Why do we go clink? So you complete the five senses, right? The last also being you put the wine in your mouth, and how does it feel, that tactile sensation that goes in there? So is the wine itself, is the quality in the wine, or is the quality in the human? And ultimately, Robert Piercek said it's neither. And let's check this, because let's say the wine hits your senses. That's at moment one. And then you create sense data. Moment two. And then that sense data goes to your head to create a thought. Moment three. Those times are non-zero. Right? We think it's instantaneous, but it's not. And those times are non-zero. So we talk about being in the moment. You're trying to push it back to a place where you have this pre-intellectual reality to it. So you're, you're in that moment and you're not thinking about it. And wine really provides the opportunity to have that moment. And so every sip of wine that I take is this continuum of close your eyes, Zen mind, beginner mind, sip it and try and keep your mind totally blank. Don't let the thoughts come in and then after you get done with that, and then you allow yourself to think about it later, right? And that time from one to the next. And that really, according to Robert Piercig, that he postulated, and I fundamentally agree, was the foundation of the Trinity that pervades, right? The first logos, the second logos, the third logos. The body, the mind, and the soul. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, like all of these, Guru Vishnu, Guru Brahma, Guru Shiva, the Trinity pervades all culture, and that quality is the interaction of the molecule with you. Then you have sense data that's created, and then you have thoughts that are created. And so as you can go back away, try and take the thought, try and take the thought out of it, and just be in that moment, you're actually pulling yourself closer to a point of what's fundamentally divinity, right? And so you talk about being in that moment and zenning out and being there, and wine really affords the opportunity to do that with every single sip. Thank you.